Hey everyone, I hope this finds you doing well. As some of you may know, I just returned from a fabulous week taking a deep dive into dentistry at the NAVC Institute. It was an amazing week, not only because I love all things teeth and because I had just the most fantastic group of instructors I could have asked for, all stories for another day, but also because I got to record several podcast episodes in person with some of my favorites. Kicking off our Institute podcast extravaganza is a discussion about exotic animals and exotic animal medicine with Dr. Dana Varble. If you listen to the podcast regularly, you've probably heard Dr. Varble on the podcast before, and we've talked about all kinds of different topics. So in this one, we focused on exotics. If you haven't heard her on the podcast before, let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about Dr. Varble and we will jump in. Dr. Dana Varble earned her bachelor's degree in zoology from Southern Illinois University and her DVM from the University of Illinois. While completing her DVM, Dr. Varble pursued a non-traditional clinical rotation schedule, fulfilling her academic requirements at a variety of alternate locations, including the University of Tennessee, Louisiana State University, Brookfield Zoo, and the University of Pretoria in South Africa. She has a background in clinical medicine, including exotics, small animal general practice, and emergency medicine, and still practices part-time, picking up relief shifts, as well as working at Chicago Exotics Animal Hospital in Skokie, Illinois. She's a national and international speaker in the field of herpetological and exotic animal medicine and surgery, and has authored several publications in that field. In keeping with her interest in organized veterinary medicine, Dr. Varble served on the board of directors for the Association of Reptilian and Amphibian Veterinarians and was president of the ARAV from 2012 to 2013. She's also a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association and the Association of Exotic Mammal Veterinarians. She joined NAVC in 2015, where her role has continued to evolve. In 2020, she was named Chief Veterinary Officer for the NAVC. And in 2021, she earned her Certified Association Executive designation from the American Society of Association Executives. All right, for this episode, I am joined by one of the greats, one of my favorites, Dr. Dana Varble. And we're going to talk about exotics, which recently I've kind of developed this like interest in just being able to see like multiple different species. I think it's really interesting and I admire people who can do it and you do only exotics. I do. Yes. So thanks for having me. Happy to be back. Always fun. I'm glad to hear you're interested in exotics because usually it's something that students and other like early career or pre-vet students are interested in. And then it seems like once everyone gets out of vet school and is in small animal, they're like, if you come to me with a rabbit, I'm going to lose my mind. So glad to hear it's a, it's a new developing interest for you. That's cool. It is. It is. So it's never been like a big interest of mine. But let's let's dive into that a little bit because yes. I feel like there used to be this like like jack of all trades approach. You know, you could, all creatures great and small, bring me anything. (laughs) Bring me your dog, bring me your guinea pig, bring me, you know, whatever, bring me your fish. Um, And that's just not the case anymore from my perspective. Would you agree? I mean, it is sort of true. I mean, uh, kudos to the amazing mixed animal veterinarians that see everything from a cow to a dog to a rabbit. That's to a chimpanzee. If we're talking about a dear friend of mine. Yeah, like they are, truly the rock stars of our profession, a very small part of our profession, because the true mixed animal practitioners is just not as many of them as there used to be, but they're pretty amazing. But I mean, exotics, like everything else, it's just, I mean, there's so much more we can do with them. We have so much more science. And we often joke like exotic pet, exotic animal medicine is... It's younger, right? It's early. We are still doing a lot of research. We don't have all the data, but it is a growing part of our profession. The exotic pet population is growing. So, and some of those, <laughs> I love exotic pet owners, but they are, <laughs> they're a little bit like equine owners or, and we always joke like bird owners are super special, but they are a group of people that will, there's an increased need for them to get pet veterinary care. And not just any veterinary care, but really specific specialty care or even what not necessarily even specialty care, but very advanced care. So a lot of things that maybe weren't as common 10, 20, 30 years ago now are happening every day. 
So I think what I'm hearing is that there is kind of this like developing knowledge in, mm -hmm. you know, kind of almost like rapidly growing because of the interest in better in exotic pet care. Yeah. So there's kind of this like rapidly expanding knowledge. And I think that extends into small animal care as well, like with dogs and cats, that there's so much that we can do. I feel like almost to a point sometimes it feels like, you know, how do I keep all this knowledge in my head? How do yeah. I remember all the species? Um, and like you said, kudos to our colleagues out there who do it because they are, you know, truly amazing. Absolutely, yes. But what's your perspective on that as far as like the degree mm -hmm. of science and specialization for every species? Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, most of the research efforts, most of the research money has been in dogs and cats more recently. But you know, we do see kind of this increased growing field of really good evidence-based medicine for exotics. It's definitely, you know, the challenge we have with exotics is, you know, an, a crested gecko is not a leopard gecko, is not a New Caledonian giant gecko, is not a day gecko. Well, then I'm out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a day gecko is like a dog and a crested gecko might be a cat. I mean, you know, so it's it's really challenging because we have our common pet species, but then when you start to get, and even in zoos, there's species that are more commonly kept in captivity, and then there's true wildlife vets who kind of deal with everything. Although I, I love reminding people that animals that are wild that are kept in captivity are different than free-ranging wildlife pretty dramatically sometimes, and their medicine can be different, so... You know, again, it kind of brings apart that whole, like, is the blood work range that we have for leopard geckos, can I use that in a day gecko? Is it any good? Is it even going to be close? And I think sometimes people forget that a leopard gecko and a day gecko are just as far apart as a cat and dog. Wow. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of challenges there, but we're learning groups that we can interpret together, um, you know, anesthesia is a whole vastly different field again. So, but there is a lot more evidence-based medicine today. And, you know, I, I look at the one thing that stands out to me is like, you know, look at where nutrition has come for dogs and cats, right? Like we have nutrition pet food companies that have put a lot of money into good research on good nutrition for these animals. Well, now we're definitely starting to see that in exotics where there's some pet food companies that rabbits and rodents come to mind, but even some zoo animals, even some reptiles, where these pet food companies are seeing value in investing in nutrition research, oftentimes including veterinarians, um, so that we can provide pet owners really good nutrition recommendations. And it's really fascinating to me because the animals that we have great nutrition data on we know they do better in captivity. So just like, <laughs> you know, the dogs that live to be 15 or now we just had one that just 21. recorded 31. No. Yes, a dog oh, in Portugal just see. lived to be 31. 31 years Verified. old. Verified. He's like in the Guinness World uh, Book of World Records. So we definitely see these species that where we have great nutrition information. We know they can be kept in captivity. We know they do well. We know they thrive. They breed well. All the all of the crested geckos own, owners in the room just went, yeah, that happens. <laughs> yeah, they do. Those things are like guppies. But <laughs> <laughs> I have those. They are breeding. We have baby yes, fish. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So you know, when we have great nutrition information, it's just a, one example though. There's other great evidence-based medicine practices that we have. Things like ultrasound endoscopy. You know, when you have ultrasound parameters on ball python cardiology, I mean, just the fact that you have measurements to compare. Too. And yeah, you might have to dig a little bit harder. It's probably not on a book on a shelf. You might have to go search a journal and, and you know, do a little bit more research. But there's starting to be a lot of good evidence based, good research for exotics. So that really helps us elevate our care, too. So I have so many questions now. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that. And yes. here we go. Um, OK, so gosh, this just this opens up like a whole Pandora's box for me. OK, the first thought that came to mind was captivity versus domestication because we talk about exotics kept oh, in ca you captivity heard my domestication so oh well I want to hear it now because <laughs> I think of like I'm you know we talk about a 31 year old dog I'm going that's not a dog kept in captivity that's a domesticated animal are we talking about the same thing so in exotics define domestication 
Okay, I would define domestication <laughs> as reliant on humans for survival. And okay. I would say the majority of our Are cats are, reliant on humans for they're survival. They're not. And I and I fully believe they are not full, they are not domesticated. A so, Frenchie, I have yet to see a wild uh, like a wild Frenchie you're not gonna running see, through the woods. There's no like wild herds of French bulldogs out there to compare to. You're right. So it's it's a really interesting question, and I actually have a whole lecture on this. Happy to give it to anyone who wants to hear okay, it. Okay, wait. Can we re revisit the cat point real quick? <laughs> yeah. Because I do want to say, yeah. no, I do not believe cats are fully dependent on humans for survival. They're I think not, we can all right? agree on that. However, the lifespan is st is significantly different. Is, and is that kind of the comparison we're making? Not necessarily. Okay. So, it's yeah, it's not, li I, you know, that's a great point, and it's not one I actually usually touch on. But the definition of domestication, it's hard to pinpoint down. So if you start doing really extensive scientific research and you start pulling from these crazy research journals that talk about the definition of domestication, you're going to get, like, if you pull 17 definitions for domestication, all 17 are going to be different. So most of them involve some change of genetics, some change of behavior, and some change of appearance. Okay, like the study in foxes where they bred them to be more friendly mm -hmm. and they became more juvenile in appearance. Yeah, they changed okay. their appearance. We changed their genetics. Mm -hmm. We changed their behavior, right? So did we, though? So interestingly enough, our dogs, again, a widely accepted domestic species, are they genetically different than wolves? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to go with 99%, not over 99% of their genetics are exactly the same. Aren't our genetics pretty identical <laughs> to some species though? And there's some, yeah, some distinguishable yes, there is, differences. But most of the differences between dogs and Canis lupus, the, the wild wolf is actually in um, gene expression and genes that modify gene expression. Wouldn't that not, be a genetic difference though? It is, but it's not, I mean, the genes are the same. Okay. It's just genetic expression that actually changes. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's again, it's, it's a, it's a fair point, though, but yeah, there's not a huge difference. So when we start talking about exotic pets, one of the arguments that people often make is that they're not domestic species, they're not good for captivity, so on and so forth, um, because you, know, you bring back, are they dependent on humans? Well, yes and no. So there's certainly some exotic pets that probably meet most definitions of domestication, things like parakeets or bugger gears. I always mispronounce that. Sorry, I everyone. Just call them budgies. Yeah, budgies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> budgies are for them. I mean, they do basically still resemble. You know, some of them are wild type. They look very similar to the wild counterparts. But we've done things where they're different colors and they act different, and they're far more tolerant of being handled and living in a cage, and they do well. Neon and they've Tetris. definitely, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they're they've definitely been in captivity for a large number of generations and had human intervened breeding and genetics during in their breeding and genetics in that time. But again, a wild type budgie looks exactly like a wild budgie. That's why they're called wild type budgies. So again, is that a domestic animal? Is it not? Uh, you could argue both ways. Ball pythons are my other absolute favorite one. Everyone likes to tell me that they're wild animals because most of the ones we keep in captivity are wild type ball pythons. They have the normal color, but we also keep ones in captivity that have a single stripe and are completely white. And some of them have blue eyes. And there's actually, and someone's going to correct me on this, but there's something like 90 some odd different color morphs of ball pythons. Again, all genetics that have been driven by humans over... 50, 60 years of domestic breeding. Um, we all, like there's a, a fully wild, like a blue-eyed Lucy, which is a white snake with blue eyes, would not do well in the natural place where like ball a Persian cat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like there are not like no one's turning over rocks in Africa to find a blue-eyed Lucy <laughs> ball python. It doesn't happen. But they, we know they do well in captivity. We know that captive ball pythons are pretty. Uh, <laughs> Their prey, uh, their food items sometimes eat them. Um, so, you know, <laughs> they're not, they're the not really the most, you know, they're definitely, they were bred for, for complacency, for being good pets. So the domestication question is an interesting one because it's really hard to define. And it's interesting because it becomes a legal term. And, like, people love to say, oh, you can only keep domestic animals. But then they don't define domestic and then people like me get up and ruin their idea of domestic. So some people say you have to breed 147 generations for an animal to be domestic. Some people say 12. 
That's um, a big difference. <laughs> yes, it's ridiculous. So basically, domestication is a. This is this is gonna bug some people. It is a subjective term. Oh, <laughs> because animals in this country that we would consider domestic would be wild in other places. Interesting. So. I'm now yeah. I'm going back to like my undergrad <laughs> genetics class where like yes. it has to be seven eighths of a certain yes. species in order to be considered a purebred and yeah. uh, and how many, you know, how the mm-hmm. generations work breeding that. Yeah. 147 versus 12. I feel like there's some serious disagreement there. Is there is some serious discord there. Yeah. Okay. So while we're talking about domestication, I was driving over to my father-in-law's house a few weeks ago mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm driving through the neighborhood and this black and white bunny (laughs) hops across the road. And I was like, you, sir, do (laughs) Do not not look like you belong here. Oh, no. And of course, he let me walk right up to him. Like, I couldn't catch him. I wanted to to, like see if I could get him home. But I was like, you, sir, do not look like you are supposed to be hopping around in the middle of the road here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's correct. Just to clarify. (laughs) Like, are there wild type black and white bunnies? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I mean, rabbits are another one that rabbits are usually traditionally invested or messing considered exotic pets yeah. but again no one's confusing your average eastern cottontail with a domestic rabbit they're looking pretty different these days yeah very much so and so that brings into like what you know we're talking about exotics here mm-hmm. but like what really qualifies as an exotic animal that's a great question uh, because yeah. you know uh, that black and white rabbit <laughs> i would venture to say is pretty dependent on humans yeah and i have Good no call. idea how many um, generations it's been through. lots <laughs> probably somewhere between 12 and 147 i'm guessing <laughs> maybe even 147 i mean Rabbits are a great example. Rabbits are widely considered a domesticated species. But, I mean, I think every veterinarian listening to this, every veterinary technician and nurse is going to put them in the exotic pet category. And I always think exotic companion mammals are really interesting because it's usually, you know, the group that includes rabbits and guinea pigs and ferrets and rodents and things like gerbils and hamsters, which are, you know, very clearly been around in the pet world whether you want to call them domestic or not again we can get into that are there wild gerbils and hamsters there there are still wild gerbils there are yeah i'd have to look Uh, there yes (laughs) (laughs) there are still wild gerbils well and i mean technically you know there's arguments about cats the little wild cats in africa are technically they're technically cats they're technically cat no they're not hamsters (laughs) that's the good news but yeah i don't know that they're i have to look up if there are wild hamsters some exotic vet, please like message me and tell me that you know of wild hamsters. We but, need to know. <laughs> but there are places where, I mean, guinea pigs are definitely raised. You know, that's a great example because I've been in places where guinea pigs are raised for food. They're sure. food animals and they're food animals because they exist in that habitat. So it's a very interesting group of animals. And I think for most veterinarians, exotic companion mammals are the ones that they are, if they're, if you're thinking about coming into it, exotics or one they're probably the most popular pets and so the other thing so you probably get asked to see them the most sure people are probably calling you saying hey can you can you see my rabbit can you see my guinea pig can you see my hamster Mm -hmm. because they are very very popular especially rabbits in certain places extremely popular Um, we're just talking about hamsters are like really big in asian countries like hong kong because they don't take up much space so Mm -hmm. they're a great pet so they're the ones I think veterinarians most commonly think about. Uh, you know, that's what I want to start learning about. I want to start learning about exotic companion mammals. Also, I think the idea of a mammal, since you're already working on dogs and cats. Yeah. yeah it's the least intimidating It <laughs> group. is. It's a little bit less of a leap. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, ferrets are basically just long cats. I mean, there's I a few ferrets. differences. but And they are important differences. Because, again, I'm going to have exotic vets, like, messaging me, like, how dare you say that? But, I mean, they are very similar to cats with maybe some – you know, some differences, but they're genetically, and again, some geneticist is probably going to correct me, but they're probably closer to cats than dogs. Okay. For, so again, just from a physiology standpoint, it's always interesting to me that there are some doggies and cat vets out there that are like, I won't see a ferret. I'm like, but you see dogs, but you see dogs. They're, and cats. Yeah. <laughs> cats are just, they're just in between. Yeah. So I they're mean, the middle ground. Yeah. And again, it's, <laughs> they're it, the very long bridge. They're just a, it's a long bridge. I get that. But yeah. <laughs> They're so funny. Yeah, they are funny. I mean, they are comedians, so. You know, we talked about kind of different different types of classifications for exotics, you know, yeah. what's truly an exotic. So, you know, moving away from the science <laughs> a little bit and into a little more fun, 
What type of exotic cases do you like to see? <laughs> so everyone will tell you my favorite is, it's definitely reptiles. I like my amphibian cases too, because I think the fact that people bring in frogs and axolotls always fascinates people. So I do love my fish too, for the same reason. But reptiles are definitely, have always been my favorite. They always will be, hands down. Are axolotls amphibians? They are. I routinely have to <laughs> Google these things. Yeah. Somebody I was, love I, axolotls. I was reading something the other day. They were livid because they realized a dolphin was a mammal. I'm like, yeah, very much mammals. Okay, Just I knew that one for yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I, this, crowd, <laughs> this crowd, that's going to be a pretty well-known thing. But yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. There are mammals that mm -hmm. live in the sea. Yeah. Very many And there are aquatic vets who specialize in aquatic mammals. This is true. Yeah. This is true. Because there are so many of them. <laughs> there are. Yes. Yes. Very. Sp and we keep them in. We do keep them in captivity and they have very special medical requirements. So it's sure. very cool. Yes. Okay. So I kind of derailed us there with my axolotl <laughs> question. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, so you said yeah. reptiles and amphibians. Are yes. there any like particular things where you see it come through the door and you're like, yes. Or on the contrary, are yeah. there things that come through the door where you're like, no. <laughs> So as, as try as I might, I, I do try and be a good bird veterinarian, a good avian veterinarian. But the nice thing about my exotic practice is there are at least two veterinarians that are much better solid bird veterinarians than me. And I try and defer those cases to them. Same with poultry, because it's that's just that's just funky smelly birds but and there are great poultry veterinarians out mm -hmm. there and I respect them because they're so much better at it than I am so well, there's so much that goes into like, like a poultry mm -hmm. vet is very different from an like well, poultry production your, vet but also right. I mean we like backyard poultry we see a lot of backyard poultry and sure. obviously I think again that's another area that has exploded in the last 10 years so a lot of people have backyard poultry and it's it's always interesting because there's a a big pet owner education part with that because if they're using their backyard poultry as poultry which a lot of people actually are they're using them for eggs less less commonly for meat but it depends for on eggs. how many times they peck your ankles yes it, potentially yes <laughs> but you know it's they don't necessarily understand that the medical care for a food producing animal is dramatically different than your pet bird like sure for everything from, uh, and again, veterinarians know the drugs I can use right. in a food producing animal are appropriately restricted and controlled and there's withdrawal times and all those things are incredibly important and there's just certain drugs I can't use. So there's a big owner education component that goes into backyard poultry, but yeah. So. And that extends to pet chickens, Absolutely, poultry. Like yes. if, they, if you can't use it in a food producing mm -hmm. animal, it doesn't matter if that person tells you they're never going to eat this chicken. Absolutely. You still can't use that. Yeah. Drug. I mean, Farad, that's the word I was looking yes, for. Yes. Yeah. Farad regulations. And I look, I have, I go back to their website all the time because I, you know, it's, again, we see backyard poultry pretty regularly, but it's so important that we protect those drugs for human use. And to be honest, even for veterinary use, like sure. I don't want us not able to get fluoroquinolones for a, you know, a dog or a reptile with a, a bacterial resistant and a, pardon me, antimicrobial resistant infection. So yeah, I can't use them in your chicken, but I get that. We have other options. They're good. They're good options, but yeah, it takes some work. It takes a little bit of work. So I go back to the Farad website, <laughs> probably a lot for, again, for a general practice pet veterinarian, I think exotic vets probably hit that website a lot more than people realize. Oh, well, and, and I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to yeah. keep all the regulations straight yeah. with everything. Well, and they change, which, again, they should. But, yeah, yeah I'm like, uh, that was the rule last month. But <laughs> it, it makes me think of, like, the APHIS website mm -hmm. and the time I spent on that website. Where I recently had one from APHIS where they said I could only, I couldn't use the downloadable form. And I was oh, like, bummer. what do I do now? Yeah, and, like, oh, dear. And of course, like the person was leaving that afternoon. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, Here we every go. Time. Every time. Every time. Yeah. I mean, health certificates and exotics are another thing because like to bring that up, you brought up, you know, yeah. APHIS and USDA. It's interesting because as a exotic pet veterinarian, it's a little different because if I do bird exports, it's a... <laughs> We're a different category. We got to take the category extra APHIS. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Got to take the extra APHIS modules to make sure that we qualify. The worst is like sometimes I do pot bellied pigs too. So again, exporting or moving pot bellied pigs state to state is not as easy as moving your dog state to state. So different set of rules, new health certificate. And again, a pot bellied pig, 
Not a food producing animal, but different rules. But you still have to follow the guidelines. Yeah. You just reminded me that I'm up for renewal this year, and I'm also a category two vet. So that'll yeah, be a fun yeah. renewal. Let's pull up those pig rules. Those are important. Yeah. You know, that really wasn't something I considered as being like is something that an exotic vet would run into mm -hmm. on a regular basis using the APHIS website. Is that like, are people moving their, I mean, I'm using exotics in a very broad <laughs> term here, obviously. Are they moving them state to state regularly? I mean, yeah, you know, exotic pets are pets. Sure. And they're part of families. And again, it's, it's different for your, you know, your hamster. Okay. Not a, generally not considered a public health risk. We can talk more about that, but <laughs> that's generally not considered works. a public health risk. But, you know, yeah, I mean, we, again, these are pets. People move with them. They take them places. They go, the number of ferrets that go camping is shockingly high. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd be shocked. And people like, and they're, you know, it's always interesting, too, because, you know, God forbid you have, this is always really challenging. I mean, we all hate international health certificates. Oh, I gosh. don't know any veterinarian that's like, I'm really excited to do an international health certificate. Doing an international health certificate for an exotic is like level 27 out of 10. Because now you not only have USDA import regulations, but you have to check CITES regulations. So the international trade in certain species is extremely restricted. Sure. Again, to try and cut down on black market trade mm -hmm. of exotic animals. So shipping your, you know, so you decide to move to Japan. If you're an exotic pet owner, there are certain things that's just you cannot take with you. No under kidding. Any like it's just going to be a no. Whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, doesn't doesn't apply to every species, doesn't apply to everything. But, we, you know, we have that extra layer of CITES restrictions on top of and it's really really important for birds because there was such a high black market trade in birds uh, especially like the parrots the citizens for so long so their trade is extremely restricted so uh, I did have I mean when you want to have an owner with a parrot and they've had the parrot for 25 years and they're moving someplace it's <laughs> Someplace exotic you cry with beaches. Because, yeah, <laughs> you know, you're like, I don't know if you could take your parrot. I have to go look. Yeah. So it just depends. It's an it's an interesting part of exotic pet practice that I, I and I don't mean to scare off other small animal practitioners because this isn't a, like a ferret problem. Like yeah. your ferret's still your ferret. Um, but you know, but yeah, yeah exotic birds. But and ferrets stuff like are that. illegal in California. Are they really? Yeah. You can't take your ferret to California. No. I had no idea. <laughs> Mind you know, blown right now. Yeah, I know. I'm like, yeah. I'm having a moment here. Why? So, why are they? so ferrets were were made illegal in in California because it was concerned that they would be an invasive species and damage native oh. species. So, ferrets are illegal in California to this day. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Again, if you're in California, you're still seeing you're still seeing lots of reptiles. You're still seeing lots of probably more birds than many other states because. It's just closer to Central and South America, and a lot of birds got got moved in over the years there, and there's some good breeding. There's some good breeders out there, so you know you're seeing other things quite commonly. So, and I'm still like I'm still on this ferret kick. <laughs> well, because it happened in Florida, not in not with ferrets, obviously, oh, but yeah. with ball pythons. Yeah, I mean, uh. invasive species concerns are big, and states are looking into restrict some potentially invasive species the florida thinks that's like a whole nother soapbox but there are well, so <laughs> yeah. well and i mean you know no offense to florida but there are literally hundreds if not thousands of invasive species in florida not say burmese pythons which are the invasive yes, species that gets the most pythons i misspoke i'm sorry Thank yeah you. they're burmese pythons um and, and again they're huge don't get me wrong they are a huge huge problem and it's scary how well they've done but I mean, feral cats are also a problem, and feral hogs are also a problem. And we have, you know, invasive frogs, and there are invasive birds, and there are invasive plants. I mean, Florida's got, Florida's, Florida's got invasive species problems. All right, everybody, <laughs> buckle up. We're going to be here for another hour. <laughs> no, talking. I mean, there's, there's like <laughs> hours and hours of podcasts out there on... Florida's invasive species problems, but we're not going to talk about that. So, uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Because because we would be here yeah. for another hour. Because yeah. yes, I have thoughts on all of that and experience with all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I've had feral hogs tear up my yard more than yeah. once. Yeah, I mean they're really bad. Oh yeah, so. it's terrible. Yeah, and not I have great. But so many thoughts on it. So. <laughs> 
But in the interest of us not, not going down around, that rabbit hole, yeah, <laughs> sticking around for another hour, let's wrap it up with like some cool cases. Oh, okay, can fun. you give us like a best and a worst? Oh, best and worst. So I'm one of the few doctors at our practice that actually enjoys working at. I, I think I'm one of the few doctors, period, that enjoys working at potbelly pigs. Screaming. <laughs> Just screaming. You guys need to use more sedatives. Okay. Yeah. Pot belly pigs are what anesthesia was created for. <laughs> like they are the poster children for I'm gonna need drugs for you to do that. But to me. sometimes you give them sedatives and they still scream. Well, yeah, but then you need to use different sedatives or more sedatives. There's some so there are uh, the reason I think I enjoy pot bellied pigs is one, pigs are very similar to dogs, and I think that catches people off guard. But we do use pigs as health models for human med. We use them as models for dog med because they're a single stomach omnivore. omnivore yeah, sure. exactly. And I think people get really antsy about them, but they're actually really cool animals because they're kind of a lab animal species too. Shout out to all the amazing lab animal vets out there who are some of the most amazing, efficient people. It's very small animals that I know. They're actually really good anesthetic protocols for pot-bellied pigs. Okay. And they're going to use drugs that you know. They're going to use carprofen. They're going to oh. use the ketamine. They're going to use dextormator. They're going to use drugs that a lot of practitioners know and are comfortable with. So I love me a pop belly pig. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they need vaccines too. So they need vaccines for diamond skin disease and rabies and things like that. And in some states, they're, it's literally a legal concern, but... Yeah, they can scream, but again, sedatives are wonderful things for them. They do really well with surgery with certain parameters in place. And people get worried because they're like, well, the parameters, the, you know, when can I, when is it safe? But we do, you know, we do the same things for dogs and cats say, yeah, all the dogs, time. Yeah. So I think they're surprisingly something that I wish more dog and cat vets to them because then as, as an exotic vet, the only concern I have is we're so set up for tiny animals. <laughs> we're so set up for your leopard gecko and your Russian tortoise and your parakeet that when someone shows up with their 75, 100 pound pot bellied pig, we got to dig. <laughs> we got to dig to the bottom of the drawer and find the big trach tube and find the big needles, but we can do it. So I do love my pot bellied pig owners. They're super fun. And if you've never done an exam on a pot belly pig, so the best way to do an exam on a pot belly pig, can I tell you the secret? I would love to hear the Some secret. Some people are guessing it already. Cheerios. That's oh. right, folks. Cheerios. You get a handful of Cheerios and you play confetti with it and you throw it around the exam room and they spend the next half hour snorting up every Cheerio that they can find. It doesn't have to be a lot. And you do a whole exam. Yes, you have to listen between the snorts to find their heart. But you but have to do that in dogs, amazing. too. Like, they can't. It's amazing. They're built for fear-free. <laughs> they are built for anesthesia. I'm telling you, they're great patients. What about for doing spays on them? Uh, so I actually love to spay them. So <laughs> she just gave me a I'm look, digging. guys. I'm digging. <laughs> yeah, no, so I actually love to spay them. I love to spay them six between four and six months of age is my preference because that's before they get really monstrous and huge. Mm -hmm. And it's before their skin gets a little bit more difficult to work with surgically. And they're usually not a size where you really have to worry about surgical dehiscence. But, like, I, there's so many shelter vets out there that would love them because of the way that their their uterine horns are shaped. They're these beautiful, like, butterfly-shaped, like, uterine horns with these beautiful vessels that come out. And they're very long because, obviously, you know, pigs have, like, 15 piglets yes. on each side of, you know, we'll, we'll have litters of 30 or litters of 24 routinely. And so they have these big, long, beautiful horns that come out with all these big blood vessels that stand out and are beautiful and are easy to ligate and you take out these big butterfly shaped uterine horns and take out you know their uterus in front of their cervix and are done hmm. and you can do it the funny thing is you can do it through such a small incision because they're so far caudal they're really big but they're so far caudal you make one little incision and you like butterfly the whole thing out <laughs> and then you ligate everything and take them all out and you live happily ever after this is this is a crazy idea, but I actually think that more vet students could learn to do spays better on pot-bellied pigs first than dogs. There's less fat in their their broad ligament. The vessels are easier to see. The incisions can be smaller. It's easier to exteriorize. 
it's a great exercise in ligating vessels. Every, there's somebody who I, who's listening to this going, you are crazy. Well, I'm just but, picturing like, and it then might we be teach Cassie. them just to <laughs> intubate the pot belly pigs. Now, and then they, yes. now they can intubate anything, anything as well. Yeah. I mean, I, to be honest, they're, they're great animals to, to spay if you catch them at the right. Now, when they're really, really big, the problem, the problem comes in. People bring them in when they're two, three years old. Because one of the ways that female pigs express love is by urinating on you. Um, and people don't like that. Understandably, I get it. So again, spaying them kind of prevents that behavior because it's a marking behavior. Well, I'm just thinking of like all my cat patients where they're like, she's in heat. I'm like, is it getting really awkward at home? Yeah, it's awkward. <laughs> like it's awkward. It's weird. Yeah. But you know, when you do them when they're really big, when you do them when they're older, their skin is really thick. It's really tough. And they're big animals. Sometimes even pot belly pigs will be 100. If they're mixed, you get really, really monstrous ones. And the risk of dehiscence, the risk of infection is much, much higher. I and I imagine in an animal that big, like dehiscence yeah. would be disastrous. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is. It's disastrous. It's, it'd be like, you know, if you're working on a 100 pound pig, it's, just, it's every bit as bad as working on a 100 pound dog spay. If not, I mean, they're both equivalently bad. Like, let's admit that a 100 pound dog spay, most people dislike that. We're used to it, right? But they're harder. The risk of dehiscence is higher. The risk of infection is higher. So, but you just try and catch them at the right time and you're good to go. You're and golden. You're good. Yep. And neutering them is exactly the same as dogs too. It's just as fast. Yes, I have done that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yes. And that was not so bad. But there, yeah. but there was the screaming. Yeah. We did block again, them. Like, you know, we did, we did locals and everything. They weren't in pain, but yeah. they still drugs. Screamed. Drugs. Yeah. drugs, more drugs, more drugs. Yeah, lots. Of These drugs. were little baby pigs. Yeah, yeah, so, little little yeah. piglets. So okay. in the pot belly pigs, we do pre scrotal again, just like a dog. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like easy peasy. Yeah. It is. Okay, so you love pot belly pigs. You know, <laughs> I do. And I, really I will like agree them. to disagree on that yeah. one. <laughs> That's okay. I sometimes like small ruminants too, which tends to fall. Again, most of our mixed animal practitioners take care of those, but I have occasionally seen some of those. As I an do exotic. love small ruminants. Yeah. So I like I've my been goats and sheep. Trying to convince my husband to let me get a goat for oh, like goats multiple are the goats best. for like years. Yeah. And yeah. I'll keep you updated. So ants. far, it's not going well. Well, and again, I. Again, I'm not going to claim to be a small ruminant expert in any way, but you know, especially like from an emergency standpoint. Most small animal practitioners have the drugs in their cabinet to already treat a goat sure. emergency. So that's kind of cool. Stay away from the dextomator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they, you know, they have many other good drugs. Yes. Yes. Many they do. other good drugs. For Absolutely. Goats. Yeah. Okay. So you love the pot belly pigs. Yep. You love you a pot belly pig. Like love I said, me. agree to disagree. Yes. Okay, so for somebody like me who, uh, yeah, I'm not diving in with pot belly pigs. I'm just going to tell you that. I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. I don't That's know okay. if the people listening to this podcast know about my fear of pigs, but I have a fear of pigs. I have, mm. Okay. There's a story there. We'll do another podcast on the fear it of pigs. It started when story. I read Animal Farm. Oh, uh, well, yeah. That, okay. <laughs> it just yeah, ruined pigs Yeah, that makes for me. sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, so for somebody like me who yeah. has this, like, budding interest mm -hmm. in seeing exotic pets, where do I get started? It's a great question. So there's a lot of really, you know, I would say try to find a good mentor, you know, try to find someone who's been doing exotics for a while, who can talk to you about maybe some special equipment that you might need in your practice or to help you maybe develop some protocols, especially for anesthesia or you know, even for how you take x-rays or how you do these other things so that you kind of have a little bit of a setup. And I always say protocols are great. I mean, you might have to adjust them. And then usually there's not a ton of special equipment, but especially if you're going to do anesthesia or do restraint, you want to be very careful. I always say, like, do what you're interested in. So, you know, if you're interested in exotic companion mammals, because that's what you're getting asked about, rabbits, rodents, guinea pigs, go down that rabbit hole, literally and figuratively both at the same time. <laughs> uh, and, you know, start investigating that. Get some CE. We have we have great CE of EMX. We really have a really robust exotics program with great program chairs that are very invested in teaching you about exotics. Get some journals. There's a journal of exotic pet medicine, the journal of avian medicine, the journal of, of herpetological medicine and surgery. Join those associations because they they offer CE at Exoticcon and at their own at other events, webinars, things like that. Vin has some great things, but 
Vetfolio has some really great things. Vetfolio so, yeah, does. Vetfolio. Yeah, and we've had some really great live webinars lately yeah. that have been super interesting when it comes to the exotics. Is there any equipment where you're like, do not let them come into your <laughs> practice until you at least have these things available? Um, you know, it's shocking what you can do with small needles and sub-Q fluids. It, it really is surprising. I think a lot of emergency practices sometimes get overwhelmed. You know, even if you can't take x-rays, if you can provide, you know, going back to that spectrum of care, if you can provide emergency treatment and get them to a exotic clinic, if you're like, wow, you know, your rabbit's more sick than I thought, but I can do sub-Q fluids, I can do an injection of antibiotics, I can do a, an injection of prokinetics. You've done a lot. You've really already done quite a bit. So not a penicillin. Not penicillin in rabbits. Good. Well, actually, injectable penicillin, yes. What? Oh, yeah. That's, that's Exotics 102. We're, okay. we're at Exotics right. 101. Okay. We won't go there yet. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, um, there are, there. you know, you start learning. Obviously, there's exceptions to every rule. But, you know, probably the biggest thing you can do is, and I think this is one of the scariest things, too, is get you, your technicians and nurses trained in restraint. Because I think that's the biggest hurdle. I think people are afraid to pick up the gerbil. They're afraid to pick up the parakeet. They're afraid that the rabbit's going to break its back. So as crazy as it sounds, it's not so much about special equipment. It's take the time. We have people come into our exotic practice all the time who just want a shadow for the day mm -hmm. and learn about how do I hold a rabbit for a blood draw safely where I'm going to feel good, the rabbit's not going to get stressed, and we're going to be successful, mm -hmm. you know? So those types of things, it seems really basic, but so many people are, and we don't get a ton of education in it in school. You maybe no. see it once, you go out, you start losing practice, you, you, you know, you don't know what you, you don't know, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I think sometimes shadowing at a, a local practice that sees exotics regularly can be huge because even going in there half a day, a day, and just checking out how they do things. I mean, I always like reptiles because I'm like, it's harder to, it's, they're so much harder to break. But I think sometimes people are feeling, you know, that they're definitely one of the um, harder hurdles because let's, let's be honest, anatomy and physiology of animals that are no legged, um, animals and, that are winged. Yeah, and the husbandry um, yeah. of these animals and like being able to take an accurate history and well, nutritional. Well, you know, and that's and the other thing. There's some, there's a handful of, again, going back to those exotics associations, AEMV, AAV, ARAV, um, AAZV, kind of my background is with those groups, the Association of Exotic Mammal Vets, the Association of Reptile and Amphibian Vets, the Association of Avian Vets, the Association of Zoo Vets, they do have great information. So the husbandry stuff, you can really start to get into from them. But you'd be surprised on Google, there are a handful of exotics clinic mine included, that where we have great husbandry sheets and they're out there for pet owners. And I always say to veterinarians, there's no reason you can't download that too or, you know, pull up that website as well. You know, we wrote those. We feel good about them. We feel like we did our research. We did our background. So it's just kind of, there's information out there on the internet. You just gotta, you gotta know your sources. But I mean, the, the fun about working with veterinarians is you guys know that you need to know your sources, right? You know, like... Dr. Google isn't reliable, but you know to dig through Dr. Google and look for, you know, a good, reliable, exotic pet practice that's going to put out things that you feel comfortable with. And maybe you disagree with them a little bit, but you know there's at least still some good information there. Well, and I feel like that would give us like a good jumping off point to mm -hmm. say like this yeah. was designed for pet owners. Like I know that this animal has a certain level of protein. So now I know what to look for when I yeah. go through these journal articles and through these different CE resources to say, all right, I know that we need a certain level of protein. Like how do we find that level <laughs> yeah. of protein? What do you even eat? Um, and, and, you know, kind of a good jumping off point. And then point you to can get into research. the fun stuff like the nutritional analysis of crickets on you know, certain diets. <laughs> Stay there's tuned some, for next time. There's some great research on that, but yeah, you know, so. Well, Dana, I always have so much fun <laughs> when we do these episodes and Good. we like, I don't even know what questions we had prepared for this because. <laughs> nope, I, not even sure. Yeah. We went down a few, again, literal and figurative rabbit holes. Yeah. So Thank goodness say, for that. Spoiler yes. alert. We followed none of the questions. Yeah. That that's okay. Prepared. That's normal. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Well, thank you again for joining me. It's always so much fun. And I always learn so much and get to have these great debates about domestication versus <laughs> <laughs> captivity. Thanks so much, Cassie.
Well, I don't know about you, but I definitely learned a lot from that talk. Thank you, Dana, for joining me. It was so much fun, even though we both had mashed potato brains after a long day of learning. Still so much fun to sit down with you and so much more learning to be had. For more episodes like this, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dbm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DBM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.